Michelle, um, you're up. Ani nsikwa kwe kwe sego. Bonjour, bonjour, hello. How are you today? My name is Michelle. I am from the Yellow Quill Reserve of the Soto Nation in Saskatchewan. And we are proudly standing on Anishinaabe Algonquin territory. I'd like to acknowledge that I too am a guest as my territory is Treaty 4 from in, within Saskatchewan. And I'd like to welcome everyone here today for a very, very important discussion that needs to be held. I'm a community developer for Somerset West Community Health Center. That's one of my jobs. And I do a few other jobs and one of them is sitting on the uh, National Steering Committee for Writing Relations. 
So today they've asked me to say a few words um, for an opening. And um, one of the things I'd like to be able to share before we start is a, a song and a little bit of a teaching. What we're speaking about today is going to be very emotional and many people are gonna have a lot of opinions and that's okay. I am burning my medicines and I'm hoping my camera will show the sage, the tobacco, the cedar, and the sweet grass that I have in there. All of those medicines we've used since time immemorial are peoples and they have uh, helped us be able to move forward. I invite you, I encourage you to use your medicines. I encourage you to remember what your medicines are for and that's to, that's to be able to speak in a good way, hear in a good way, keep your mind open and keep your eyes alert. All of people's body languages is read. We do not want to have misinterpretation of people's um, movements or anything like it happened in Quebec with Jagmeet, with Jagmeet Sim. So like, you know, we have to understand all of these things. So I'm gonna start in a good way as the medicines are lit and I'm going to sing a song for the peacekeepers. And the peacekeepers are the ones that are the most important warriors on this planet because their goal is not war. It's about keeping the peace. And I pray today that we all keep the peace amongst ourselves and that we make the changes that we need to be made amongst each other and in a good way. Hey! Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, for uh, setting the, uh, the ground for us, for grounding us to start this conversation. My name is Suhail Ben Sliman, and I'm a member of the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project. The Punishment Education Project is called CPEP. We're a group of community members professors, uh, teachers, students, uh, work, frontline workers, uh, that we are united for one reason. And the reason is to live in a world without human cages, without policing, without the use of violence in order to create safe communities. Because we believe that the violence that is predicated in, in systems uh, that, 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 that the violence that is inherent in these systems 
harms more than it does good. And we know that because just in the last little while, we lost several lives of indigenous peoples, black peoples, Afro-indigenous peoples on Turtle Island. We know that when community members come into contact with police, a lot of time the consequences are death, like in the case of Regis Kochinsky Paquette, Jason Collins, Dan DeAndre Campbell, Orlando Brown, Andrew Loku, Jermaine Carby, Kwasi Skane Peters, Mark Ekamba Boykwa, Sami Atim, Ian Price, Alain Magluar, Nicholas Thorne Balance, Fong Na, Tony Du, Rene Gallant, Abdul Rahman Ibrahim Hassan, Bonnie Jean Pierre, Abdul Rahman Abdi, Pierre Corleon, Bryden Whitestone, Josephine Peltier, Nicholas Gibbs, Jessica Mal Singh Lail, Chad Williams, Greg Ritchie, Machwar Madut, Sean Thompson, Randy Cochran, Aisha Hudson, and so many more. Therefore, we come together today as community members in order to start building and continue building those alternatives. We don't claim that we are the first people to do this. We are not the first people to do this. People been engaging in the same struggle, struggle for a long time. However, we come together to continue on that struggle and to move past uh, violent ways of, uh, of, 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 of relating to each other, uh, violent uh, systemic uh, violence, systemic racist ways uh, that keep the colonial, genocidal, uh, anti-Black, racist, uh, heteropatriarchal, uh, sexist machinery going. I come from this discussion myself as someone who's criminalized, who've been to the, to the pen, to the jails, who is currently facing a deportation order to Morocco. I've come to this, converse, to this conversation because I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of talking to comrades on the inside on a daily basis that tell me about the atrocities that they are facing inside. I'm sick and tired of talking to or seeing these images, these horrific images, you know, of police officers trying to enforce borders and trying to, uh, you know, enforce these laws that are colonial, that are racist, in order to keep some people safe and the rest of us gets thrown under the bus. The rest of us are chewed by the, by the machine and we are damaged. We are already traumatized. Our shoulders are broken. We cannot take this anymore. We, uh, we cannot take this anymore and this is enough. That's what I come from this. I'm tired, I, I haven't cut my hair and you know, a lot of people are dying. My hair doesn't mean nothing, but I just wanna show that, you know, I haven't cut my hair, why? Because I, you know, because trying to do this work, especially now with COVID-19, with the pandemic that we were facing, I found myself, you know, in the house, listening to horrific horror stories on a daily basis that seem to get just worse. Thank you for everyone who came to share space with us to give us their insight. I can't wait to learn from y'all. And I'm gonna give uh, the floor to Ayan, who is a fellow CPEF member, who is a community, a very important community member, like all of us. And uh, I will let Ayan uh, lead the uh, conversation uh, as uh, she sees fit. Okay, thank you, Sahil. And thank you, Michelle, for that beautiful opening ceremony. Yeah, so how can we keep each other safe? We may not now live in a world free of police, prisons, and state violence, but we have promises. We have the promise of indigenous sovereignty and governance. We have the example of communities already working outside of state systems. Uh, to respond to and intervene to violence, like the Transformative Justice uh, Collective in the Bay Area, uh, the Audrey Ward Project Safe Outside the System Program, and the Bear Clan Patrol in Winnipeg. 
And we also have the commitment of everyone here joining us today, so thank you. Uh, during a teach-in that the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project put on a couple of weeks ago, uh, crime and justice scholar Vivian Salahanna offered us a uh, really eye-opening uh, analogy. Um, she compared domestic violence to state violence. Um, and she explained that we're in a centuries long abusive relationship with structural racism and abolition is the exit strategy. Abolition is the friend and the auntie and the staff at the rape crisis counselor giving us tools, helping us make a plan, giving us some money, fixing us meals and making sure we have a safe place to stay. So I wanna put that question to you. What should our plan be? And what does safety look like in our communities? But before we get into that, I have not introduced you all. So let me do that. Today on our panel, we have Andy Vicente of Sanctuary City and Anna Kvayan, Ottawa, Carly Miller of Kindspace, Gabrielle Fayant of Assembly of Centers and Generations, and Ali LeBlanc. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my original question, which is what does safety mean to us? What does What is a safe place to live? What are safe communities? Can I start with you, Carlin? Um, communities, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I feel like um, maybe lots of us have like grown up with the idea that like that's not really a thing that um, can exist or like certainly hasn't existed for us um, maybe ever. Um, I think safe community, hmm. it looks like, it looks like some like a place where we can love each other through our struggles. Um, it looks like a place where we don't exclude people um, because they uh, made a mistake or caused somebody harm. Um, I think that it's not everybody's work to do that. Um, so lots of our experiences, um, what we have worked through, what we haven't worked through um, will mean that we can't participate in certain conversations or to do um, certain intervention work um, with people. Um, but that is in part of building a very like diverse resource filled community um, with lots of people who have the time and energy and attention to work with people who um, have like harmed others, maybe uh, done like some incredible levels of harm to other people um, on an ongoing basis. Um, but with the understanding that, you know, um, violence is not um, a personal failing, it's, it happens in the context of um, a society that allows it to happen. Um, and communities that just sort of allows it to continue. Um, and so it is our like collective responsibility um, to take responsibility for that, not just um, the person who did the thing, but um, for the community around that person um, to hold space for them, um, to also give them resources, to also address systemic things that are happening in their lives that have brought them to that place. Um, and for also and to also um, do those things for the person or the people that were harmed as well. Um, and for the community around that has been witnessing um, that violence take place. Um, so there, there needs to be sort of like a whole bunch of different levels interacting with each other. Um, but I think the core thing is um, really being able to love each other, really being able to see each other's humanity um, and knowing that every person um, uh, deserves to be loved and cared for even when they do really horrific things. 
Yeah, thank you. So what I'm hearing is that it's not only that we are sharing space and resources, but we're also sharing accountability. And we're not just like focusing in on this one point of harm, but actually like the constellation of structures that create these harms. Yeah, thank you so much, Carly. Um, Andy, can I go to you? Hi. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, in response to your question, I think Carlin covered quite a bit of what I was going to say. Um, but just to reiterate, um, I would say that uh, it looks inclusive, um, it's compassionate, it requires an incredible amount of humility um, from all community members, um, especially when we're talking about accountability, um, especially when we're talking about um, openness and like, and trying to um, figure things out, even though you might not have all the tools and to, to leave that fear out of doing the wrong thing aside um, and to, to just act. Um, and I think it also encompasses um, uh, just the ability to, <laughs> to rest um, and to take time to reflect I think often um, we jump um, and react um, because we're emotional beings um, and things uh, trigger and like hurt us in different ways. Uh, and so to just be able to take the time to reflect um, is important and to continue having conversations um, in particular like open conversations um, where people feel safe in having uh, conversations. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So it's kind of, it's not necessarily an endpoint. I'm hearing a lot of uh, continuation and like ongoing conversations and we're always in community and not community as like an end goal, but a place that we're always trying to be in. Yeah. Uh, Gabrielle. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess a few things about safety is I'll just share um, some, some like requirements that Indigenous youth that we work with told us. Uh, so we actually did um, a report recently about mapping Indigenous youth services within Ottawa. Um, and it's no surprise to us, but there is really limited um, safe spaces for Indigenous youth in Ottawa. And this is something that we've known for many, many years, but um, we had to do our own research to prove that, you know, because again, like when we talk to like city officials or government or any of these structures, it's like no one believes us. They need to have like a research report in order to actually believe us. And so we're like, here, here's the proof. And uh, what the youth told us, their requirements for safety, they're really simple. Um, and so that makes this even more frustrating. Like it seems so simple, so why isn't it happening? And so the requirements, we narrowed them down to about, um, about five. And so what they told us was um, that safe spaces have to be led by community. It can't just be like a non-Indigenous org um, that wants to create a safe space. It actually has to be led by community. And so what that means also is that there's protocols involved with that. There's safety measures that are already implemented or that have existed there for for decades and it continues work from previous generations. So that's like the importance of community. Uh, they also told us that it has to be, there has to be peer to peer support. Um, so there has to be, there has to be room um, for us to work together. Um, and it shouldn't just be all uh, dependent on one person. Um, for example, that's kind of just how we work. It's not like there's uh, like one youth coordinator, but we're all, we all take on the responsibilities to take care of each other. Um, and this also, this is sustainability. Um, so this means that 
if we lost funding for we, we don't even have funding but that's a whole other story but if um that youth worker was to move on to a different position, the whole program wouldn't just fall apart. Um, and that's kind of what we see right now within youth programming in the city that's funded, um, is there's a lack of consistency. And so that interrupts relationships that are built. It interrupts trust that young people have. Um, so young people also told us that the spaces have to be culturally safe. And so we create, a lot of the spaces we create, we say that they're exclusively for Indigenous youth. And this isn't because uh, we want to offend anyone or anything like that, but the reality is, is that when a white person shows up in an Indigenous space, right away they think that we are there to answer their questions. But that's not what we're doing. Like we need space to just hang out with each other, understand each other, um, and not have to educate or be anyone's therapist. The other thing they told us is that the space has to meet youth where they're at. So it has to be judgment free. Youth have to be accepted however they are, however they present themselves. Um, and that, that means that, you know, even if um, they're not in a good place, whatever that means to them, they're still able to show up and no one will judge them for where they're at. Um, and then the last thing they told us is that there has to be space for self-autonomy within those spaces, for those spaces to be safe. And um, yeah, that's, you know, just just allowing people to, to be who they need to be um, and make their own choices. Um, but also there's also support there so that they can make really great informed decisions. But again, it's, it's their decisions. Um, another way we kind of create safe spaces is that we've created like a living, a living document of group norms. And it's just like really basic stuff, like respect each other in the space. Um, like don't touch anybody, like unless you ask for permission, um, things like that. Um, and it talks about like all of like the, the stuff like not to do, but it also encourages young people to um, have fun and sing and laugh in these spaces. And so uh, that was also group norms created by young people themselves. Um, the other part about safe spaces is that they're actually really hard to create. Um, so we kind of like hear people talk about safe spaces and it, it sounds like really great and like a fairy tale almost, but safe spaces, um, it's a struggle to create them because a lot of the time we're, we're competing with everything else around us um, and safety is really a privilege. So we've had to fight to create whatever little spaces we have. Um, you know, so much was taken from Indigenous folks and nothing was really ever given to us. So we're still waiting for reconciliation to happen. We're still waiting for restitution. We're still waiting for reparations. Um, but until that happens, we will continue to keep each other safe and create those spaces that, that young people need. Um, and since we've been gathering as, as a community, as A7G, we've never had to call the cops. Not once. Um, we've never had, a, we've never experienced violence within our group. We've never experienced like theft or like, you know, any of these things that Indigenous youth are often harassed for um, in, in public. Um, but we all, we all kind of look to those group norms and we have an agreement with each other. We respect each other. We also know that if we call the cops regarding a mental health crisis, that that will actually further impact that person's mental health in the long term. Uh, so for example, um, you know, the reality is that, that some of the young people that we work with, it, you know, experience, experience wanting to commit suicide. That's just the reality. And if we called the police every single time, you know, these young people would be taken from their families, they'd be put into the hospital, or they'd be incarcerated. And how, how do you think that would help someone's long term mental health, it would just make that mental health crisis so much worse. Um, we actually, we never actually called the cops as a, like a group, 
but we have like um kind of like an organizational mentor that did call the cops once and they had to call the cops because they received death threats from a white woman they received death threats on their voicemail from a white woman and this white woman was uh, um, making death threats towards a7g and towards indigenous youth and you know what the cops did nothing you know so why we, we don't rely on the cops for all of these reasons. They're either making situations worse or they're not even taking us seriously. You know, there is indigenous women that have gone missing in Ottawa and cops again did very little to address these situations. And there was even a cop that made really derogatory comments about that woman that was, was murdered. Um, so these are just kind of like some of the, the situations that we're experiencing. Also, you know, I want to acknowledge that creating or understanding that safe, like there's not really such a thing as a safe space. There's safer spaces and that's what we aim for. We aim to have as less harm as possible in the spaces that we gather in, but it's, the reality is, is that we can't actually create like a safe space because everybody's experience is different. And I also want to acknowledge that a lot of my understandings of um, reducing harm and creating safer spaces was actually um, provided to me or, or taught to me by many two-spirit folks and trans folks. Um, so I really appreciate all of that, all of those learnings that I've, uh, come to receive over the years. Uh, so miigwech, hi, hi, thanks for having us. And I have uh, Maddie back here who, should, Maddie's gonna answer some questions later on. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much, Gabrielle. What you shared with us about A7G's uh, commitments already to using alternatives to policing out of necessity, right, um, is so important. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, what also stuck out to me is how um, you're talking about it needs to be community led and we need to be specific about what community means, right? Like people want to say the Ottawa community. I don't know what that means. Like <laughs> um, these initiatives need to be um, led by the people who are most impacted by police violence, people who are um, who are at the intersection of these struggles, who are, who are facing these harms on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you for that. Um, Ollie, what does safety mean to you? Hi, um, before I get into this, I just wanna say that as a 14 year old was a Mitzi woman, I realized my white privilege as being, you know, majority, being a majority white woman and presenting as white. And I use my privilege to, you know, try to um, make a space that's safe for all my POC, LGBTQ+, disabled and mentally ill siblings out there who need a space um, for, like, just need a space to be themselves and where there's no fear, where they feel safe. And going into safety, when I think of safety, I think of a space where there's no fear whatsoever. No fear of being caught dead because you made a mistake. No fear of going to the store and ending up shot or murdered and, or never found again. No fear, no trauma, no unreliability, no unfamiliarity with the system. It's all built, that's what the justice and the police system is built on today. Trauma, unreliability, and ignorance. And we need to change that. We need to make these community-led alternatives that are by the public for the public and we, and we have to support each other with unity because that's the only way that we can come together and create an actual safe space, a safer place for all of us. We need unity. We can't have, we can't be separated. It's proven that people are stronger numbers and we need to come together for a world like that. We can't just sit back and wait for it to happen. We need to take our initiative and we need to work towards it. It's not a trend. It's 
something that affects people every single day and it has for centuries and it needs to stop now because if it doesn't stop now we're just it's going to keep going and people are going to continue to get hurt and are going to continue to go missing and are going to be continue to be served with a false sense of reality that isn't the truth and hurts minorities more than you know and it would be a dream to have a society where we depend on each other, where we're all educated about each other's cultures and struggles and we respect them instead of appropriating them and, you know, discarding them. And I want to build on what Gabrielle said of A7G um, with how, what, how they view, how interesting you view um, safety so simple. And I view it as like to be safe, to feel safe is so simple with the group around you, but the systematic racism and systematic homophobia, um, Islamophobia, all these, you know, systems that are built from oppression, they have, they're built with fear. They run with fear. They honestly kind of run on fear and it's upsetting. And I would love and I'm going to fight with every last ounce of privilege and energy in my body to make sure throughout my life that I can do everything possible to make sure that these safe spaces are created for not only other mates to you, lesbian women, but for everyone, trans women, trans men, two-spirited individuals, indigenous individuals, all POC, all religions, every single person needs to feel safe in order to have a society that is um, sufficient with each other and can work with each other. And that's really all I have to say. I want to thank the CPP for this platform and yeah, thank you. Amazing, thank you so much, Ollie. Okay, so we're all on board that the current system is not working for us, but our communities have internalized the logic of the state. We shame each other, we seek revenge, we isolate each other. So how can we look beyond getting past cops? We organizing past the absence of cops and instead organizing towards the presence of the values that we want to, to hold, the presence of the practices, the best practices that will keep us safe, the presence of the world we want to live in. Andy, can I go to you? Hi, um, can you repeat that question, please? Oh, oh uh, there we go. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so I want to talk about, so after the police, we still have each other. Um, so instead of organizing past cops, how do we think about organizing the presence of the values and practices and um, measures that we need to put in place to keep us safe and have the world we want to live in? Hmm. Um, there's so many things. <laughs> But I think um, just in terms of time, uh, I'll talk uh, a bit about um, two initiatives um, that I'm a part of. Uh, so uh, I'm part of Enigma in Ottawa. And for folks who aren't familiar, um, it's a Filipino youth organization that strives for national democracy and justice in the Philippines. Um, but the Filipino diaspora also work um, here to try and um, build that solidarity. Um, and one of the initiatives that um, we're doing right now is called Kapit Bisig, which uh, translates to linking arms. Um, it's a community initiative where uh, we um, are trying to basically fill in the like very big gaps um, that are within our system that um, has left a lot of the Filipino migrant population in, in limbo um, for so many reasons. I mean, um, I could talk forever about how um, within the Philippines, uh, not only do colonizers like take our lands, 
um, but they also tell us how uh, to exist in a space that doesn't belong to them. Um, and for that, uh, it means that there's multiple restrictions um, and injustices and really just uh, an entire um, community that's being exploited for their labor um, and in return, um, not feeling safe in the communities that they want to establish a home in because they can't establish a home in a place that has been taken away from them. Um, and I'm sure that concept can resonate in a lot of marginalized communities and a lot of communities that have been systemically colonized um, and um, really feel the impacts of oppressive isms, essentially. Um, and so back to Kathy Bisik. Uh, so Kathy Bisik, we're trying to help workers and like on a very frontline basic uh, basis, like uh, just like providing food, um, you know, a space for them uh, to kind of talk through their frustrations uh, around some of the systemic uh, stuff that have, is oppressing them at the moment. Um, a lot of them are separated from their families, which is another result of border imperialism. Um, and yeah, really trying to support folks, but also um, I, I find that a support has to go like both ways. Um, so uh, yes, like we're supporting folks in need, but it doesn't come without recognizing that uh, everybody is in need of support. Um, I work in mental health and addictions and a lot of the time the perspective is that um, the client is the broken one and we have to fix them and we have to, um, we are the, you know, we're like the sole uh, people with like all of the knowledge and that we don't have hurts ourselves. Um, so there is an understanding with Kathy Bisig is that we're all in it together and that we're all striving for the same thing, which is like better livelihoods um, and safer spaces to be in. Um, uh, another initiative that I wanted to quickly talk about through uh, Sanctuary City, um, and for folks who aren't familiar with Sanctuary City, it's a coalition committed to making um, uh, Ottawa more inclusive and safe for all its residents. So it focuses on uh, making a city where, uh, you know, regardless of your immigration status, um, you're able to access municipal services. Um, and so one of the trainings um, that we're um, trying to organize for next month um, seeing as the refugee hearings are going to start um, in August, resume in August, um, is um, kind of like, I would say, because I do doula work, it's kind of considering it like doula work, um, where you um, attend hearings for refugee claimants and really hold um, the folks really deciding um, whether or not someone stays in this country accountable. Um, and uh, knowing that there is someone in the room that wants you to be there, like really makes a difference um, in, in quite a few people's lives. And so hopefully we'll be able to get that off the ground. And as soon as the hearing starts, um, we'll be able to have uh, enough volunteers to be willing um, to share space and kind of work through a lot of the really um, oppressive like systems that are here to kind of, you know, keep us in line. Um, yeah, that's all I'd like to say. Yeah, thank you so much, Andy. Um, yeah, I, I think um, it's important to be specific about like who we are, um, who we're trying to protect here. I mean, the majority of uh, people of color in Ottawa have been at one point landed immigrants. Um, in Ottawa, the uh, black population, I think it's like majority um, Somali and Haitian. Uh, these are people who are racial pro racially profiled by police and police. I think I saw a statistic. Uh, don't, I mean, you can quote me on it, but just check later. But it's something like uh, the, the police across Canada call um, border services like 10,000 times a year, so some, some number like that. And it's, that's racial profiling. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's really important to uh, consider that when we're talking about community alternative policing, this doesn't only include what's happening here at the municipal level. Um, it's happening in, at um, the provincial and federal and ultimately um, seeking to end uh, state violence, border violence, 
uh, just as um, Andy mentioned. So thank you so much. Uh, Carly, would you like me to repeat the question? Because um, we've been talking for a little while. No, that was <laughs> good. Okay, um, great. Oh. To move past needing cops and you know the police force, we have to think of, first of all, even before we think about alternatives, we need to think about the group who are responsible for creating these alternatives. And for that, we need representation of those who have been oppressed by this already racist system and have those people be in charge to make sure that we don't make the same mistake again. We need to make sure that those who are oppressed now are not oppressed with the new system that we want to create because the sole purpose of the system that we are trying to create is safety for all, safety for all ethnicities, religions, cultures, sexualities, identities, everything. And to ensure that they have what they need in these in these alternative uh, in these community-led alternatives, is we need different departments for different needs, such as mental health, domestic abuse, wellness checks, etc. Different departments for different situations, because it's insane how there's one system for every single type of need. Like you, it's just you don't go to the same doctor for all types of pain, why do we go to the same system for every situation? It doesn't make sense in my head. So we need different departments, different people, different training for each department. And of course, in those situations, it, well, with those departments, they, they, they can't start by themselves. And that we would, be, we would need funding, which could come from defunding the police and putting that money back into our communities with these community-led alternatives so they can be you know, sufficient. And even if they are nonprofit, if they are, I don't know, but we still need government support in order to make these sufficient and you know, helpful for all. And um, yeah, that's really all I have to say. Thank you so much. Carling, how can we talk about uh what we'll do after the cops are gone um well so i don't actually think we need to wait for cops to be gone because it's gonna take them quite a while to just sort of fade away um if they ever do um but i think that um i think i'm someone who likes to sort of look at what other places are doing uh, what other like organizations and community groups have sort of like figured out how to do in sort of small ways. Um, so I don't know how many people watching this have read the book, um, The Revolution Starts at Home, in the beginning of the book, uh, the Community United Against Violence um, is you know, talking about a bunch of different things that they are doing in their communities. One of the examples that they talk about is a project called Safety Labs. Um, where it's basically sort of practicing how to respond differently to different types of harm. Um, and I thought that was just like a really beautiful idea. It was a really short um, explanation about what they um, had been doing and there wasn't a lot of information online and um, I haven't been able to get a whole bunch from the organization itself in terms of understanding more about the project, but um, there is, organizations in Ottawa who have a similar sort of practice. So Community Mediation Ottawa, um, with their mediators, they do practice nights. Um, so they you know, come up with scenarios around conflict and they all get together and they practice together about how to mediate that conflict. Um, circles of uh, support and accountability. Um, they definitely do trainings, but they have like a a practice model around how you support a person that has um, committed violence or harm, specifically um, people who have been in prison are coming out of prison and have elected to join um, that process to have that support system to help them not reoffend. Um, so I think all of these, we can like really take from all of these and, and the things that people have figured out 
about um, how to set up structures that work um, and that are targeted towards like a specific um, thing that they're trying to address. There's, um, there's also this app that currently is in the States um, called Safe Night, which works with, which is like a, an app that works with um, a, a bunch of like domestic assault um, organizations usually that have uh, um, like beds and stuff. Um, they all sign up for this app. Um, and so on the back end, you know, they put in all the needs that they have. And on the front end to the user, so donors sign up for this app. Um, and when it's needed, an organization can like push a notification to their donors to be like, hey, we have X amount of people who need a safe place to go. Can you donate X amount of dollars to pay for a hotel room um, and something like that? So there's there's a whole bunch of like different, really unique ways that people are figuring out in their specific um, industries. I, I work in nonprofits, so um, I'm usually always looking at what other nonprofits are doing and what kind can do. Um, so I think I think people are already doing things. I think that we can. Um, look at models of that and figure out what makes sense in an Ottawa context, uh, because Ottawa is very different than a place like San Francisco. Um, but those things can be done. Um, so we just need to have more open conversations about them. Perfect, thank you so much. And we have I'm going to say two more minutes. I'm going to leave the floor to Gabrielle and Assembly Seven Generations. Uh, what do you think on this question? Um, sure. So um, the reason why I actually am in a car right now, <laughs> uh, myself and like some other Indigenous folks, we got some Neheao and some Haudenosaunee and some Anishinaabe, <laughs> and I'm I'm Métis from Alberta. Um, we're actually like on a road trip. And um, we're stopping and camping and reconnecting with the land. Um, some of us have, have not been to these lands before. And some of us, like this is where our ancestors have lived for like thousands and thousands of years before Canada. Like if you look at the history of this territory that Canada now occupies, it's actually like indigenous people have actually lived here for like 16,000 years. And Canada is only 153 years old. So just like, like let's remember that um, Indigenous peoples are the experts of these lands. And Indigenous folks have had safety protocols in place. But through racism, through systemic and structural racism, our expertise has been um, forgotten disrespected, removed even from many of our memories. Um, and so that's something like I really think is important is honoring indigenous values and philosophies. And the reason why I say values and philosophies is because indigenous, the term indigenous, it's like an umbrella term for, for over like a hundred different nations. Um, but within all those nations, there's values and philosophies um, that are tied to the lands that we walk on, that we work on, that we play on every single day. Um, so why are we not honoring those? Um, and why do we always compare those, those mental health practices, those safety practices to Western um, ideas of, me of medicine? It's always this comparing and, um, and things like that, but in not listening, listening to our voices. Also, um, so part of that is also land back. Um, we we in Ottawa we had we had we had a ceremony. Uh, we wanted to have a ceremony for Indigenous and Black lives that have been taken from pr police brutality. The call for for us in Ottawa was actually to have a four day sacred fire. That's what we would. That's what some of us would do when our loved ones have passed on. We would have a sacred fire for them. But in the city of Ottawa, there's actually no place for us to even do that, you know? So give us some land back, literally. <laughs> like we just wanna be on the land, like have our ceremonies, 
have our gatherings and and that why is that so difficult why is that <laughs> such a hard ask um the land was stolen you know so the like one of the first things Canadians should do when they understand that the land has been stolen is like give some land back <laughs> it's you know these things I just I they make me laugh sometimes because it's just so silly um the other thing I wanted to mention is like I love doulas <laughs> I think I'm like I wish that doula like the knowledge that doulas have should be sex education like every kid every parent everyone should actually understand the same knowledge that doulas have not that everyone should be a doula because i think that's a specific expertise and, and skill and and gift but just like why do we not understand our bodies like why do we not understand um each other and and just like just like basic things um but i really love and i also love trauma-informed care and um making informed decisions and i i've i've learned that from from doula training um i think that you know there needs to be more peer-to-peer -peer support like i love peer-to-peer -peer support i think indigenous folks have been doing peer-to-peer -peer support since we have lived on these lands it's just natural like a circle a circle is peer-to-peer -peer support um but for other folks that maybe don't have peer-to-peer -peer support in their cultures like cool make manuals like understand what it means and how it how it helps all of us also would love to see more community leaders youth program coordinators that are trauma-informed as well as trained to handle mental health um and i and just to go a step beyond that i think that being trauma-informed and trained in in how to um de-escalate how to intervene in a good way when someone um, has a crisis. I think that again, like every kid should know this. It should be in our education systems and parents also need to have this information. Um, and I think those are like the main things I wanted to share on that. But I also wanted to pass the mic over to <coughs> Maddie. Okay. Hi. Um, this is pretty difficult in a car. Um, <laughs> but I hope you can all hear me and stuff. Uh, so I could, I could probably like be imaginative, be creative and, uh, just have kind of like a full stream of consciousness, like rant, rant forever on this. Like I could probably spend many, many, many days, um, engaged in these like kind of lines of thinking and imagining, but, uh, yeah, just some of the things that came up for me when I was listening, um, to you all were, uh, like, yeah, just stress on education. Um, it's just, it's so, it's so complex um, and so personal, all of the things that we're discussing. So um, yeah, one size does not fit all in terms of like policing alternatives. Um, that has to be kind of connected to what um, Gabby was sharing. Um, that has to be specific in my, from my perspective, sorry, Kelly, if you're in this. <laughs> from my perspective like that that needs to be absolutely needs to be um specific to the land the territory um the place that location so like you know like someone said in, in san francisco in like miwok territory that's very different from nishinaabe aki here so um you know that's that's not something that can be like all these constructs of um those settler colonial countries these illegal occupations, Canada and the States, um, that doesn't work at all whatsoever. And it doesn't make any sense because uh, it's like painting an entire continent with one singular brush, right? Like to say that Canada has a justice system, Canada has a justice system. That means, um, that means like you're not taking into account the, uh, I mean, obviously, but the teachings from the land the different types of land, the different types of territories, right? Like this road trip is going to take us from so-called Ottawa to so-called Banff. And <laughs> that like, we're going to just drive through driving in one direction. We're going to see probably like five completely different types of landscapes. Um, and all those landscapes have very ancient information, expertise, sciences um, that should be dictating how things how things happen 
um, we should be like keeping those specific to territory and not separating kind of like humans from the land, right? That's like a really uh, a root of a lot of like misguided directions. Misguided is a very, very gentle, generous way of saying that, but more like um, colonial uh, erasure, erasure of ancient knowledge and information that we can all be benefiting from. But we've got to listen to the specific, the specific land, the specific places. And it's not all one. Canada isn't one big, one thing. Like there's so many, so many nations, territories within, and like the when the landscape changes, to listen differently, I guess. So hopefully that was clear enough. Yeah, I'll pass it back. Cool. That's it for me for now. But I don't have any answers. <laughs> Should that's okay. Thank you so much. That was full of answers. I don't know what you mean. Um, yeah, I, what I really um, liked about what both of you had to share was that this idea around community alternatives to policing and what are the skills that we need? What are the approaches that we need to take? They're not far away. They're not, they're not hidden. People are already this with our elders, we need to engage with community, um, we need to come together as we are doing right now um, to gain these skills. And a lot of these skills, um, like you mentioned, the training, a lot of this is literally just gaining the knowledge and tools to understand ourselves better and in turn understand. which will be moderated.